Well, the, the challenge that you're poking at, and I think I think you agree, is most people have to become the person that's worthy of the things that they want, right? And so, you know, based on your time thing, your analogy right there, I don't care if you know what your spouse is, male, woman, female, whatever. It's it's are we in? They people will say, I don't I don't like my relationship. Well, how much time are you investing in your relationship? Right? You're living with a person, and maybe you know if you're a man, you haven't taken your wife, your wife on a date in five years. You know, I, I meet with clients, I'm like, well, how often do you date your wife? And, and they're like, they look at me like, she's my wife, why would I date her? Well, why do you, you know, how do you think you expect to get what you want out of a relationship if you're not investing the time and effort it takes to create a great relationship, right? Otherwise, you're just two different people living in the same household. I don't, you know, you shouldn't, even be, you shouldn't even be sleeping in the same bed, right? You're just strangers. And so really that time blocking is not time blocking just for productivity for income, which is important, but are you blocking time for your kid's soccer game? Are you blocking time to take your wife on a date? Are you blocking time for family barbecue on Sunday? And those things become the priority. I'm present, I'm focused, I'm ready. I'm not checking my cell phone because that's that's where I'm at at that moment. Right? Just like I'm here interviewing with you right now. I'm not checking my email while we're talking, right? A lot of people think multitasking is getting them closer to their goal. The reality of it is it's actually taking them farther and further away. This is the Play Your Position podcast, where we huddle up, call the plays, and inspire you to run your ball into the end zone. Are you ready to score more game-winning touchdowns in your life, business, and career? Then listen up. Because it's game time, baby. Now, here's your host, Mary Lou Kayser. Hello, hello, Team PYP. Mary Lou Kayser here. Welcome to another episode of the Play Your Position podcast, where we discuss what it means when we say yes to the call to leadership. And today is no exception. I have a phenomenal guest who is suited up and ready to take the metaphorical field and share with us his journey as a leader um, in different parts of his life. His name is Joe Evangelisti, and he is coming to us from New Jersey. So, Joe, are you ready for kickoff? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. This is what I know about Joe, guys. Uh, Once known as the Flip King, Joe Evangelisti is now the host of the Legacy Blueprint podcast, and he is a leading expert in real estate investing, specifically in the self-storage industry. After experiencing burnout from chasing single and multifamily deals, Joe walked away from his wildly successful flipping empire and transitioned to the world of self-storage. Today, Joe's mission is to show others how to tap into the massive opportunities hidden inside the self-storage industry, opportunities that require far less time, less risk, and exponentially more profits than any industry in real estate. Prior to his real estate empire business building exposés, he served in the military as a builder in the U.S. Navy Seabees. He's been recognized by Bill Clinton, He has won numerous service medals. And like I said, he lives in New Jersey with his wife, Ashley, and two wonderful girls. And Joe, thank you so much for making time to come and share your story here at the Play Your Position podcast. Absolutely, Mary Lou. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So right out of the gate, listeners like to have some context about Mm -hmm. you. Would you share with us your story about when you got that call to leadership, Joe. How old were you? What was going on in your life? Was it a moment of inspiration or was it more gradual? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny you asked me this early and I think it's, I think it happened sometime. So right after high school, I had, I had a a call to serve first, right? I wanted I knew I wanted to serve the country. I knew I wanted to be in the military some way, somehow. And I had the, the good fortune of, uh, a, uh, a foreman at the time that I was working for, my dad's general contracting company, was a retired uh, senior chief in the Navy Seabees. And uh, the Seabees are the construction battalions uh, of the Navy. A lot of people don't know that they even exist, but you know they, they run around, they build stuff, and they do it all by by plane. We don't see any boats or ships or anything like that. Okay. And uh, you know, so so this this uh, this guy at the time, his name was Dave. It said to me, you know, you can be a builder, and I and I grew up around construction. I love construction. My dad was a contractor, and you know, I, he said, you know, you can serve in the military and do construction. 
Uh-huh. And I thought to myself, tell me, tell me more about this. Cause at the time <laughs> I, I had no idea, you know? And so inevitably uh, with his help, I was able to do a delayed entry program. And uh, just about right out of high school, I um, went into the, the military. I went into the U S Navy CBs and, I think almost immediately I felt that call to leadership in boot camp. I mean, immediately when I got surrounded by, you know, a, a group of folks that were, you know, ready, willing, and able to create a uh, team and connection and environment, it was, you know, I just kind of automatically got the calling for it and um, was able to really kind of lead, be one of the leaders inside of my boot camp division with a hundred and some, you know, folks in there. And, uh, and, and actually got meritorious advancement out of boot camp, which is, you know, their way of saying like, hey, thank you, you did a good job or, or whatnot, kind of a pat on the back. So I think that was probably the calling right there in boot camp when I first started. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never heard of the CBs. And mm-hmm. my brother has been a general contractor since he was 18. So I have a real affinity towards people who build things, especially houses and really awesome buildings and renos and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. that's that's cool that you were able to make that connection and um, also have the experience that the military, only the military can give people, you know, when yep. it comes to, to shaping your, your, the rest of your life. And so you transitioned out of that and entered real estate right away, or was that more gradual too? No, yes, yes and no. I, right out of the military, I did six years as a, as a builder. And then right out of the military, I actually went to work at uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency in Washington, D.C., for a, uh, a commercial contractor, a government contractor. And uh, I did that for about a year and a half in kind of a leadership position. I was a project manager running, you know, $20, $30 million projects. And then I met my wife, who was uh, from New Jersey. And I've always joked that like her umbilical cord was never cut because she can't be <laughs> away from her mom for very long. And so uh, she moved in with me and we lived in DC together for, I don't know, four to six months, something like that before I figured that, you know what, we're going back and forth so often. It's just crazy to not move back home. And, um, you know, so within a year or so, a year and a half, two years of me getting out of the military, I was back home. And uh, that's really when the the, the real estate bug started. And uh, we started investing in real estate. Okay. Now, in, in the intro, I shared with listeners that you reached a burnout phase. And talk talk about that because i i don't think we talk about burnout enough especially with leadership because there's a, a, so much pride that leaders have that hey you know we can face any challenge right that i'm i'm i can overcome this but the reality is is that sometimes we can't so if you if you'd be willing to take us into you know that space of hey i'm doing great oh my gosh, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of us, you know, and, and this happens this this happens to all of us all the time that you're going to experience places where, you know, you, you feel uh, emotionally burnt out or physically burnt out or a combination of, of, the, of the same. And, you know, it's happened to me multiple, multiple times in business. But the real, the real aha moment, the real like shape-shifting moment for me was when my kids were really young, and uh, we were in the process of building up the, the single family fix and flip business. You know, I would I would call my wife and tell her, like, you know, like, I'm not going to be home for dinner. Right. And, you know, I think mm-hmm. most entrepreneurs, you know, go through this experience. But the one night in particular, it hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. It, it, I called her at 630 and I said, I'm not going to be home for dinner. And she said, yeah, no kidding. Dinner was at 530. Right. Like you've already uh. missed dinner. It's too late. You know, and then I got home at like 930 that night. And I went and kissed my, my girls um, in their bed and they were already asleep. And I thought to myself, why am I getting home at 930 at night? Like, what did my day look like? I wanted to reflect back on what did I really accomplish today to make it worth not seeing my kids at all? Because I'm up at 430 in the morning generally. So, you know, I'm not seeing them in the morning. I'm not seeing them at night. And what, what occurred to me, Mary Lou, was that I was in bed thinking to myself, I did most of my work between 630 and 930. Right? Mm. I did all the important stuff, what, what I call now high gain activities or high income activities. I did all those in that three hours at the end of the day because I spent the entire day doing quote unquote busy work, right? I was putting out fires. I was answering calls. I was returning texts. I was checking email 6,000 times. And I was doing these things that, you know, I didn't know any better, you know, and no, nobody had ever taught me, Hey, these things are not productive. They're just busy. And so um, you know, I, I, I tend to say now that a lot of these uh, folks that are putting out fires all day long, they're generally also secret arsonists, right? Like during the day, uh, they're behind the building, oh, lighting it on fire so that they can pat themselves in the back and say, I did a great job putting out fires today. 
But are those fires really the things that are driving your business forward or getting you closer to your outcome? Um, and it wasn't until that real like epiphany that like something's got to change uh, where I started investing in mentors and coaching and masterminds and really surrounding myself with highly productive people, you know, people that would get things done in three hours and then spend the rest of the time with their kids or their wife or their friends. Um, and, and that's where things really shifted for me. Wow. You know, I love, I, I, I responded obviously to what you said, because I think that's, that there's a lot of truth to that statement that um, many entrepreneurs are, are closet arsonists just so they can say, yeah. oh, look how great, look at all this stuff I did. Um, I've never heard anybody say that. And that's why it really hit me between the eyes. And you're right, Pete, we're not taught. You know, so many people, well, I mean, most people in this country anyway, go through the school system. And unless you grew up around entrepreneurship or business ownership, you're, you're not learning that in school. It's, mm -hmm. only, it's only because you were either called to do it or, you know, like for yourself, you got out of uh, the military and, you know, hey, let's try this, right? Uh, you've heard the good things about X, Y, or Z. And to lose the time with your children or a spouse or wh whoever, um, you can't get that back. You can always make money, but you can't mm. make more time, mm. right? Preach and, it, preach yeah. it, yeah. So you, you discovered the power of working with mentors and coaches. Um, talk to us about that in terms of, um, was there one particular person that really showed you the way? Was there you know, a program that you went through or was it, again, a combination of, of just a lot of different experiences that helped break you of that busy, non-productive approach? Yeah, I think it was definitely um, a combination of me being uh, actively engaged in controlling the clock and controlling my time, um, like realizing that like something has got to give, there's got to be a big shift here. Um, and the people I was surrounding myself with. So at that time, I joined a, a, a real estate nationwide real estate mastermind, which forced me to get out of my comfort zone and fly to different places to meet these folks. And at that time, you know, giving up a day of my time was massive. Like, you know, I was mm -hmm. one of those. Again, we still we talked to these 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 entrepreneurs. Like, I can't take a day off. Well, mm -hmm. is that a belief problem or a values conflict? Like, why is it that you can't take that day off? And a lot of people, when they really answer that question, it comes down to ego. Right. Again, we're, we're out there setting fires so we can pat ourselves in the back. And that's all ego based. You know, what's the point of working from 6 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. And, and not and get, not doing anything when the reality of it is when you boil it down, the important stuff could be done in a few hours a day. And so controlling that clock. I love that you use football analogies because I use football analogies like what are the best you know, sports people in, in you know, look at Tom Brady. What does he do? He controls the clock. If he's down by 21 points in the third quarter. Like you don't see Tom sitting on the sidelines with his head down between his legs saying, oh, it's all over. What's the point? Right? No, no he, you don't. He, he, <laughs> or you <no>. didn't. <laughs> or you didn't. You never do, right? I mean, you know, I got I to gotta update my analogy now that he retired a few weeks ago. But, you know, the idea behind that is he knows that if I run the ball, drain the clock. If I throw the ball and I get it, you know, a long pass, maybe we'll score and I'll, I'll get it, you know, turn the ball over. Uh, defense will turn the ball over and control it for me. And he stays in the game. Well, the best performers that are controlling their life clock are the ones that stay in the game. We have this rule called the rule of 168. And really what that means is there's 168 hours in each week. And every one of us on earth living, all of your idols, all the people you've looked up to, all the people you've wanted to emulate, they all live by the same rule. Like Tom has 168 hours a week, Oprah and Elon Musk and, and, and you know, Mark Cuban, they all have 168 hours each week. So why is it that some people reach levels of achievement that are unheard of and some people wake up decades later and wonder why their life hasn't changed? And mm -hmm. it's all about where we're putting our time and our effort in these high gain activities or high income activities. You know, going to work and not making income is, is not productive, right? It's mm -hmm. not good for your family. It's not good for your team. It's not good for the people around you. Same as not putting time into your body and your mind and, you know, spending time breaking a sweat each day and spending time journaling and spending time meditating and, and making sure that you're mentally and physically prepared for the achievement of success that you want to get to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people wake up, unfortunately, you know, like I said, sometimes decades later and they say, man, I wasted so much time and I didn't, I, and I didn't do the things that were necessary to get me where I wanted to go. 
you, you had said something a minute ago was so profound. And, and, I've, and I've said this multiple times, like my kids are now nine and 12, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not having more kids, but I'll never hold a three-year-old again. Right. You know, I'll, I'll never have my five-year-old, you know, jump up into my arms because they're too big to pick up now. You know, my nine-year-old's barely, barely big enough to pick up and, and she's tiny, you know, so mm-hmm. it's, you're not getting that time back. You're not getting five years old. You're not getting the four-year-old birthday candles. You're not getting their first time on a two-wheel bike. It's not happening again. So if you miss that, it's lost. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. Yeah. My my oldest just turned 26 yesterday. So let me <laughs> tell you. Let yeah. me tell you. It it flies by. And you know, and I think um not to I think for for fathers versus mothers, you know, depending on the dynamic of the of the marriage or the arrangement, whatever it may be. You know, when you have children and, and one of you is a business owner, or you're both business owners, you know, it it comes down to what you were just saying is looking at how much time you have each week and making decisions about how am I going to allocate my time. And a very good friend of mine once said, her mother taught her, she said, Mary Lou, you can get so much done in an hour, way more yeah. than most people think. And I'll tell you, you can, but you oh, have absolutely. to set your mind to it. You yeah. have to like... You know, it's amazing to me how many people do just just languish because they don't have a sense of time and, and they don't have their priorities straight. That's another piece is, you know, we can talk about success all day long, but there are actually people, Joe, that don't, they say it, oh yeah, I'd love to have that, but they'll never get it because yeah. they'll never get clear about what it is they really want. Well, the, the challenge that you're poking at, and I think I think you agree, is most people have to become the person that's worthy of the things that they want. Yes. Right. And so, you know, based on your time thing, your analogy right there, I don't care if you know who, what your spouse is, male, woman, female, whatever. It's it's are we in? They people will say, I don't I don't like my relationship. Well, how much time are you investing in your relationship? Right. Mm-hmm. You're living with a person, and maybe you know if you're a man, you haven't taken your wife on a date in five years. You know, I, I meet with clients. I'm like, well, how often do you date your wife? And they're, and they're like, they look at me like, she's my wife. Why would I date her? Well, why do you, you know, how do you think you expect to get what you want out of a relationship if you're not investing the time and effort it takes to create a great relationship? Mm-hmm. Right? Otherwise, you're just two different people living in the same household. I don't, you know, you shouldn't even be, you shouldn't even be sleeping in the same bed, right? Mm-hmm. You're just strangers. And so really that time blocking is not time blocking just for productivity, for income, which is important. But are you blocking time for your kid's soccer game? Are you blocking time to take your wife on a date? Are you blocking time for family barbecue on Sunday? And those things become the priority. I'm present. I'm focused. I'm ready. I'm not checking my cell phone because that's that's where I'm at at that moment, right? Just like I'm here interviewing with you right now. I'm not checking my email while we're talking, right? A lot of people think multitasking is getting them closer to their goal. The reality of it is it's actually taking them farther and further away. It absolutely is. I mean, there's science that says we can't multitask. It's a it's a complete fabrication. And I, yep. uh, you know, I agree 100 percent with you about it's not just it, it. The blocking has as much to do with the rest of your life as it does with your work, whatever your work mm-hmm. happens to be. And mm-hmm. again, it comes down to being clear about what it is you want your life to look like. And not, not there's not, not a class on that. When we go to school, and unless no. you happen to be lucky with parents that model that for you, or you get a great teacher or coach along the way who talks about life things, not just subject matter things, um, many people don't ever learn the lesson. And they do wake up one day in their 50s, 60s, 70s and say, what what, what did I do with my life? Now, I'm a firm believer that's never too late, right? That mm. you can. I just talked to a guy earlier today for this show who was 50 and he didn't have mm. a bad life. He said he didn't have a bad life, but he, had, he woke up at, when he was 50 and said, why am I not where I want to be? He wasn't married. He wanted to get married. He wasn't making the money he wanted to make, blah, blah, blah. And he dove into Think and Grow Rich and Mm -hmm. really took that book seriously. And he said within a couple of years, he met the the woman of his dreams and married her, became a six, uh, excuse me, a seven-figure business owner. Now he's teaching some of the most elite college football coaches in the country. Mm. And he said it was all because I made the decision. I didn't like my life. (laughs) 
and yeah. I wanted a better I, one, you know? And and guess what? That's that's the precipice for most of my coaching clients. I can't tell you how many clients I've taught that were, you know, 10, 12, 15 years older than me. And their their biggest their biggest drawback is they don't live the life that they think they deserve. Mm-hmm. Right. They don't think they're living up to their true potential. Mm-hmm. They don't. And the time is growing short. Well, here's the truth. We don't know how much time we have. No, we don't, we don't know if you're going to be here 60 years, 70 years, 40 years. We don't know. No. So, you know, when we let this time drag by, it's not it's not helping us create. And, and the gentleman you're speaking about, he made the decision to start to live an inspired life. Mm-hmm. And that's truly something to, to it's amazing to witness when people make that committed decision to invest in themselves and to live an inspired life, an intentional life and, and doing it with intentional actions instead of just kind of drifting by. Yeah, it's true. It's halftime here at the Play Your Position podcast, and we've got ourselves a great game. While you're up grabbing another snack and topping off your favorite beverage, make sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss another play. PYP is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever great podcasts can be found. Now, let's get back to the game. You know, you're working in a space that most people, I imagine, when they think of real estate, don't think of. They're not like, oh, no. self-storage. And yet, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you. what brought you, uh, how did you discover that this was or is um, a real, you know, pot of gold, so to speak? Yeah, I, I will tell you, uh, it was another, it, it was another um, born out of kind of almost frustration moment. You know, when mm-hmm. we were scaling up the single family business, we got to close to 100 uh, houses a year, fix and flip, where we buy, rehab, and resell the projects. And it was such a voluminous business, such a transactional business, such a massive, intensive cash flow business um, that it got to be burned out. Like, I mean, you can only do it for so long because you're running. I, at the time, I had 50 employees. You know, we had houses closing every week. Um, you know, closings getting pushed, cash getting tight. Then you have you have a lot of cash one week and no cash the next week, and it got crazy to manage because uh, really because of our location specific it was a lot of part of it. You know, in, in South Jersey where I live, we, we flipped houses from a hundred thousand up to 1.5 million. So it was really hard to systematize and automate and create good process around. And so at one point, three or four years ago, my partner and I looked at each other and we said, okay, it's the end of the year. We did, I think 88 houses that year. What do you want to do next year? Do you want to do hundred? Do you want to do 120? And he looked at me and he was like, I don't want to do 88 again. You know, yeah. So, and I was like, "You're right. I'm glad you said it because if one of us didn't, we would have done this all all over again." And so that was the precipice for saying, "Okay, I have to find something that's more easy to maintain. I can do with a more efficient and effective team, and where it's much more scalable, right?" Because when I say transactional with single family, it's like you flip a house, you make cash. You flip a house, you make cash, but you're not building any long term cash flow or wealth. Right. right. You're just making a bunch of money. And that's all good if that's what if that's the business you want to be in. But for me, I like to build businesses around my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And I learned that years before when I had that first breakdown that this isn't the lifestyle I want. And then I just built and scaled a big business that took over my lifestyle again. And so I said, okay, we're going to do it again and we're going to find a business that is scalable, manageable, effective, efficient, creates cash flow, creates long-term wealth, and fits our lifestyle. And so the, the biggest the biggest thing that popped out to us was apartment buildings at the time. And this is pre-COVID. So a lot of things have changed in the last couple of years. But we started looking at um, multifamily assets and big apartment buildings. And, and what was that? Well, it was the red ocean. I don't know if you're familiar with the blue ocean strategy, yes. right? But yes. everyone's attacked. That's where the sharks were feeding frenzy at the time, right? It was just super competitive. You know, 50, uh, 50 offers would go in on an apartment before it was sold. And from the outside looking in, I saw that occurring and I said, okay, I need a blue ocean, right? Maybe it's going to be retail strip centers. Maybe it's going to be office. And what's the storage thing? And I got lucky enough that I ended up talking to what is now one of my mentors and had a conversation with him. And he said, Joe, I was where you were five years ago. And he had built thousands of single families. He had built restaurants. He had built a lot of the big homes, um, uh, Oh man, let me think. What's what's on Long Island? The uh, that's where super, I live the, right now. Yeah, Hunt, in the Hamptons. Uh, Hamptons. The Hamptons. The Hamptons. Yeah. Yep. So he My built brothers Hamptons. built houses out there, <laughs> right? Yeah. And he he says to me, Joe. Uh, he was on his fifth deal at that time, his fifth self storage deal, and he said, Joe, once you build a self storage, you will never build another single family again, including your own house. 
you'll go out and hire someone to build your house because you won't have time for that stuff anymore. Right. right. And I thought to myself, how's this? He, he said, look, it's, it might be a hundred thousand square foot, but it's all concrete, steel and asphalt. That's the whole building. You're not picking out paint colors and tile and, and countertops and cabinetry and trim. It's, it's concrete and steel. Mm-hmm. Like you're building boxes. And he, so at that time I said, well, man, you know what the problem with this business is? It's not sexy, right? Single family fix and flip was made sexy through HGTV and yes. flipping houses and all this Chip stuff. Chip and Joanna like, Gaines. And- yeah, Chip and Joanna Gaines and everything looks mm-hmm. pretty and it's beautiful. But the reality of it is the numbers are sexy, right? When you look at self-storage, you're building concrete and steel structure that rents almost like an apartment building, yep. only at half the cost. <laughs> And I started saying to myself, well, okay, I can see myself doing this. And he said, look, you build a 100,000 square foot facility. It's not the same as building one house, but let's say it's the same as building three or four houses, Mm -hmm. right? What do you make in three or four houses? And I would say, okay, well, a couple hundred grand a piece. We'll see where we're at. Well, I tell you what, when you build a self-storage, you'll make two or three million. Okay, well, now my ears are perked up, right? Like, Mm -hmm. okay, now we figure out how to make this happen. And so that's what led us down the road uh, of taking the, the big leap and, uh, you know, but the only thing that uh, people ask me is, well, we, we quit cold turkey. I can't believe you did that. Well, once I saw the vision and I understood the scalability, to me, there was no way to, to make that shift slowly, right? We just literally right. stopped the single family. But we we're like, pause, no more purchases, sell off what's left. We're getting into self-storage. And that transition was pretty difficult. But at the end of the day, well, well worth it. Yeah. Yeah, there's two big takeaways from that story. The first one is the most recent, which is you recognize that this would this fit in with your big vision for your life. And yeah. so it was a no-brainer to just pull the plug. Okay. And and that is scary. That is scary is. because the the other business was familiar. You know, you knew mm-hmm. you 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 could count on that. You, you'd had experience. And then the other one, um, the other piece is you started that story with, it was born out of frustration. And that I think for anybody listening is, I think we all can, we will all reach points in our journeys when you really have hit that literal rock bottom, whether it's because of addiction or it's because of burnout from the the work you're doing or a, a, a really bad relationship or whatever it may be. And it's at that point when, so many opportunities suddenly that you totally didn't see before now become possibilities. And, Mm. uh, you know, as you were describing the self-storage, you know, I was was laughing to myself because I'm like, yeah, you get to cash in on Americans' obsession with holding on to stuff. (laughs) We just keep so much. Oh, my goodness. You know, pack it in. We don't have room in the house. We better go rent a storage unit, you know? Well, I'll tell you what's interesting. Uh, Another thing that that same mentor said to me at the time, he said, Joe, you could take a map of the United States and throw a dart at it and build a self-storage and be successful. Wow. Right. And he says, not that you should do that, right? (laughs) What we want to do is find the top 10 or 15% of MS market areas, MSAs, um, that that makes sense. He said, but here's the thing about self-storage. 98% of self-storages that are built become successful. Uh, right. And if you think about that stat, it's unbelievable. I mean, I think 65% of small businesses are around in three years, you know, 98%, you put a storage there, it's going to, it's going to survive. And so the, the industry is very diverse. A lot of people think of it as our extra junk sitting in, in, in a, in a box, which a lot of it is that there's people up, upsizing, downsizing, moving to different States, you know, they have their stuff in temporary storage, but it's also very diverse in the fact that you have contractors, you have, uh, contractors with extra materials. You have contractors, sure. some of them that are possibly running out of the, the storage, which isn't really legal, but people do that. Yep. Um, you have people, you know, storing files. You have insurance companies, attorneys that have to do file storage. And now we also have a lot of work from home folks that have product, right? Maybe they live in a smaller apartment, but they, they're selling some kind uh. of product. So they'll rent a little five by five climate controlled unit to put their products in. So the interesting thing about the the industry, which makes it really almost bulletproof over the last 40 years, is that whatever happens trending in the, in the economy, it doesn't really impact self-storage. Because when, you know, let's say the housing market goes down and contractors are, you know, slowing down, well, you know, something else comes and takes its place, right? Maybe people are moving and, and they're downsizing because the market's, you know, really tough, All right, Well, now I need somewhere to put my stuff. You know, an inverse happens in a, in a good economy. So, it, it, there's always somebody to take the space, which is really interesting, as long as you find the right location. 
Okay. So you just mentioned 40 years, right? So that's mm-hmm. a pretty lo- good time span. I mean, where, mm-hmm. as far as saturation goes, you know, uh, where where is the industry today? We're not even close to tapping into the necessary, uh, in certain areas, right? Certain areas are slow to uh, ramp up. If you're in a rural area and you have a self-storage, it's not going to really work as well. But the closer you can be to an urban area, especially an urban area that's increasing in uh, pop in popularity, like People are moving to Florida. People are moving to Texas. And we're building six sites in those two states alone. So you want to go where the, where the action's going. You want to go where there's a diverse economy that, that's employed by multiple different companies. You know, like in Atlanta, for example, um, I think you either have, is it Coca-Cola or Pepsi? One of those is based Coca-Cola. in, I think it's Co- Coca-Cola. Yeah. Um, you know, you have, you have the uh, Cancer Research Institute. You have all these major, major companies in, in one local area, mm-hmm. where if, if one of them moved out, it's not really going to affect the economy, right? And so uh, we like to be in MSAs that are expanding, that are diverse as far as income. And, uh, you know, and, and, and when you do that and, and you know your, your, your competition, you know your demographics, you know the area uh, accessibility and all that type of thing, um, once you know it and it's systematic, it's really not that difficult to find great sites. All right. Well, good to know for anybody listening who's, you know, thinking, oh, this could be a possibility, or they might know somebody who's looking for their next opportunity. It's uh, it's fascinating. I've, I've never talked yeah. to anybody about self-storage <laughs> as a business. And <laughs> I did interview a man not too long ago. His episode will air this month. Um who's in the laundromat business, same thing. Laundromats are not sexy. I think I, think I interviewed him too. Um, Dave Mance. To Dave Mance, yeah, yep. super nice guy. Yep. Super nice, really great story, really great yep. story. So yeah, I mean, that's the thing too about um, succeeding in business is most people want to go towards what's sexy and cool and mm-hmm. that becomes super saturated, super fast. Very, very hard to really be the top, you know, to be a, a, a real leader you want to find the things that people tend to turn away from. And, you know, having a a brother who's in construction, you know, I've seen that the dark, the darker side of life, you know, the the places that do scrap metal, for example, um, mm-hmm. the the reclaimed wood, you know, things that are dirty and and messy and stuff. But mm-hmm. man, people are making bank on this. Making stuff. a resurgence, right? All of a sudden mm-hmm. everybody's trash is somebody else's cash. No, you it's got it. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. So what about um, as you look ahead? I mean, I know you've talked about that you've hardly tapped into things, but you know, with the, with the way the world is, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic, but we've got some things happening on the world stage now that add to the uncertainty again. Um, mm-hmm. When you look into your crystal ball, Joe, uh, what do you think is going to have the greatest impact on how all of us show up and play our positions in the next, you know, five years or so? Mental toughness, I okay. think, is the first thing that comes to my mind, right, is is what is our mindset and how do we control our mindset? You know, I'm a big advocate of just just don't watch the news. You know, yeah. you control your own environment, your own economy. You control the people that are around you to a certain extent based on how you hold yourself. Um, and I think that, you know, the more that you get sucked into the negative and you allow your, your brain to be kind of consumed by that, the more it's going to happen, right? I, you know, the COVID was a big wake up call for a lot of business owners. You know, I think the perception publicly is that a lot of people in business got rich because of handouts and because of, you know, PPP and UILD loans and all that kind of stuff. Or I don't know if I said that right, but, you know, I I think it's the opposite. I think what happened was COVID created an adversity for a lot of businesses that forced them to do the things that they maybe ought to should have been doing all along. Mm-hmm. Right. They they started to cut down on excess spending and office space. They started allowing their, their workers to come in virtually. And all of a sudden that actually created opportunity. And then they reinvested and they grew. So you saw some companies that that did three, four, five X what they normally would do in a in a you know, what most people would say is a very challenging time. Now, mm-hmm. I'm not taking away from the co- the companies that couldn't operate because of laws or if they were in restaurant or service industry, but for a lot of us who aren't in that industry. This created an opportunity. And if you didn't take advantage of the opportunity given to you, well, then shame on you. Then maybe, mm-hmm. your, maybe your mindset needs to be changed or maybe you need to get more, a little bit more mentally tough. But you know, things are going to happen. They always have. And people always win and people always lose. You have to decide which side of the fence you're going to be on. Yep. It's so true. So true. Well, we're at the part of that show, uh, the show I call Touchdown. I was talking to you about it in the pre-chat, which means... 
Joe, I'm putting you in the red zone with less than 30 <laughs> seconds left on the clock. You're down by four points. It's now or never. Tell us a story about when you helped to get that ball metaphorically into the end zone for the game-winning touchdown. I actually have a, a, a recent story um, probably two months ago. Actually, it was right after Christmas. Uh, we had a deal that was supposed to close, uh, you know, raising three and a half million dollars to close a syndicated deal. And we had, you know, the holidays, traditionally, absolutely most difficult time ever if you're having money conversations, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's either A, they don't have the money because they're spending it, or B, they just don't want to be bothered with going and sending a wire. So our team, which was all relying on a deal to get closed in uh, in in 2021, you know, all thought, hey, this isn't going to happen. And uh, me and my business partner literally sat on the phone for three days in a row and and brought in over two and a half million dollars to close out a deal that we didn't think was going to get done. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, that that's the first moment that comes to my mind. Oh, it's a great story. Yeah, because the yeah. holidays, so many people just give up in the holidays. Yeah. They, don't, they don't even try. Yep. Yep. Oh, good for you guys. That's awesome. Absolutely. That's really, really great. Well, listen, for people who would like to know more about you and, and the work that you do, the, the coaching that you offer and the programs, where do you hang out online, Joe? Uh, they can just find me on Facebook, uh, Joe Evangelisti, obviously, uh, or they can also go to, if they want to get in the storage business, you know, we offer a mastermind group, which is really made up of four different variations, people who have no experience in real estate that want to learn how to get in the business, developers who are already doing self-storage, folks that are making that transition like myself, they want to do single family and then they want to transition into something more scalable like commercial real estate. And, and last but not least, accredited investors, folks who want to invest in these type of deals, but really want to learn more about the individual developers and builders and buyers. Um, we offer a, uh, a mastermind called the, uh, the Storage Syndicate and it's at thestoragesyndicate.com. All right, great. Yeah, the the link for that will be on your show notes page at pypodcast.com and, and I'll also link to your Facebook as well for people who want to check you out, you know, learn more awesome. about you and 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 what you're about. And um, before we say goodbye, what is one book or two that has made a difference to you, Joe, on your leadership journey? Yeah, the first real major book, and I read I read literally tons of books. I have audio books constantly open. But the first real big game changing book for me was actually Tim Ferriss and the Four Hour Work Week. Mm -hmm. You know. He wrote that right when I got into real estate in 2007, and it really stuck with me. You know, I, I always referred back to that delegation and automation and systematizing and, you know, becoming more efficient. And even when I fell into those holes where I wasn't very efficient, I would always go back and say, okay, well, what, what would the book have me do? <laughs> right? Like, what would the, you know, so the four-hour work week is a concept, and it's not really about working four hours a week, but it's like, imagine if you could, right? And And how do you take different retirements and different trips uh, during your life instead of waiting until you're, you know, of retirement age traditionally. Right, right. What What are you reading right now or listening to? Uh, I just got done finished. I just finished reading the Deliberate Discomfort, which is a book uh, by Jason Van Camp. He interviews just some amazing performers, a lot of people that were in the military, talking about the, the concept of really getting comfortable being uncomfortable, which is mm -hmm. one of the principles that I teach and I coach on is how do we stay in that zone where we're constantly challenging ourselves? Because the work and the trials and the tribulations, the challenges, the discipline, that's what creates the happiness. That's what creates the success, that's what creates the results. And so, you know, getting deliberately discomfort is uh, discomfortable, or uncomfortable is a, um, is, is a great, uh, I think, a great uh, ability for a lot of people. Okay, that's, that's a good one. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, the 4 hour work week is interesting because, to your point, it's not literal, right? For not no, working. I mean, exactly. We yeah. we get meaning from work, right? Like mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. so many people who think, oh, if I could just play golf all day or whatever. I I can't tell you many men, particularly I've talked to, who said, you know, I was done with golf after about the third week. <laughs> They're like, I need. <laughs> I quit. I quit four years ago. Almost cold turkey. <laughs> you know, club. it's like yeah, yeah. It, it. There's just something about being part of a mission of of being part of a building something. I mean, we're builders, you know, to use your the yeah. word you use. We, as humans, we are here to build things, whether it's families, buildings, uh, you know, met beautiful metalworks or art, jewelry, mm -hmm. books, everything. You know, you've written a yeah. book, haven't you? Yeah, I've written four, I've written four actually. I'm, okay. written, I'm, I'm working on my fifth and sixth right now. <laughs> wow. So what are your yeah. books? 
Uh, well, so the first one was on flipping. Was uh, it, was called, it was called the Mastering the Art of the Flip Game. Uh, the second one was actually on um, creation of, uh, you know, what I call whole scaling. Back then, I was doing a lot of wholesaling of single family houses, and it's about scaling your business and, and creating out of that business. Uh-huh. Um, the, sec- the third book is on self-storage investment. Um, creating, you know, great self-storage investments. And um, the fourth one's going to be out any day. Oh, that's, and what is it about? Coaching, creating, you know, creating what I call the five roads to victory, controlling the clock. You know, I love what you just talked about with controlling the clock because time freedom for a lot of people, you know, they, they think it's like sitting on a beach with a margarita and watching <laughs> the sunset for, for days and days in a row, right? But for high achievers like us and, and you know, you and I, it's, it's, it's controlling doing what you want and when you want. Right. So it's, yep. you know, being where you want to be, doing what you want to do and still being productive. Yes. And for, for time managers, you know, controlling the clock is everything. That's that's the most valuable resource you have. It absolutely is. And it also, you know, another misnomer about time management is not that every every single minute is planned and structured. In, in fact, I think, you know, some of the best times in my day is when I'm just thinking you know, like mm-hmm. that's the activity I'm doing. I'm thinking, or I'm, I might be do, do, like folding laundry or, or cooking a meal, but it's, it is part of the big vision. You know, it isn't mm-hmm. this like, oh, when is this going to be over? You know, that's, yep. that's a, that's a big problem for people is they just want to get to the end of the week so I can relax. Yeah. Really? You're going to, you're yeah. going to just <laughs> blow this whole week and be miserable yep. all week just so you can get to go to the bar or what, whatever you're doing. That's your life. I'm, oh gosh, don't even get it's me crazy. started. <laughs> the whole thank God it's Friday movement is, is nuts. You know Terrible. what I mean? It's like, I, if I say thank God it's Monday because I can get back to it and we can yeah. start having conversations again. Everyone, everyone's been off all weekend. So yeah, no, I, I definitely feel you on that one. Yeah, it's um, it's, a, it's a strange, it, when you're on the other side of that, like, but that isn't even part of my worldview. I love, mm. I love everything. I mean, do I have days? I'm sure you do too, where you're like, wow, I'm just really tired. You know, I'm like physically or emotionally just worn out because that's normal. Like our bodies, we're not supposed to be constantly in motion, but it, it's a mindset. It's like, I'm going Absolutely. to rest. I'm going to spend time <laughs> away from my phone. I'm not going to open that laptop. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Oh, yep. well, Joe, this has been great. You are a fabulous guest and Thank you for sharing um, your experiences with an industry that I think most people really don't know much about and all the lessons that you've learned through your life and how that each one led you to the next big achievement. And congrats on all your books and the one that's coming out. That's really awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Hey team, Mary Lou here. Who's number one in football changes from year to year? Fashion trends come and go, same with musical tastes, but leadership skills... They never go out of style. In fact, these days, leadership is an essential survival skill for a world that demands more from us than ever before. To succeed these days, you need to know how to show up for yourself so that you can then do the work you love with people you like the way you want. The Play Your Position Leadership Playbook helps you do this, and it's free. Go to pypodcast.com to download your copy today. If being more successful this year, next year in the 21st century is on your to-do list, get your copy of the Play Your Position Leadership Playbook now. PYPpodcast.com. It's at the top of the page. You can't miss it. That's PYPpodcast.com and start being more of the leader you are meant to be today. This podcast was produced by Daniel Romeros. Show notes for this episode can be found over at pyppodcast.com. I'm Mary Lou Kayser. Thanks for listening. Here at the Play Your Position podcast, we believe that the road to self-mastery and a life well-lived starts with answering the call to leadership. That's when the fun really begins. Send this episode to any friends who might need to hear the inspiration and ideas you heard today. And feel free to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform. 